Out of Stone Cold, the Hellraiser is back. Here we go. Evolution of the Shield. John Cena versus the Show. Stop her. Hulk Hogan and The Rock in the same ring. You will never take my place at the head of the table. Undertaker on the Hell's Gate submission. Oh, my God. What? My God, Michaels just kicked Cena's head off. Hey guys, what's going on and welcome back to Rivalries on the WWE Podcast on the Saturday, July 31st, as again, coming at you a day later, but uh, given all the amazing other shows we have now on this feed in you know, what if segment with Matt and myself and the and the highs and lows in the week and the SmackDown review. Maybe this will stay on uh, Saturdays for, from now on. Who knows? But either way, it, we are here and that's what's important. Better late than never. And to be honest, it's my girlfriend's birthday today. So that's the reason why I'm running a bit late. Had some birthday festivities last night celebrating it. But um, that's not why you guys are here. You guys don't care what's going on in my personal life. You guys are here for a rivalry. And today we are going back to the summer of 2001 for The Rock versus Booker T right in the heat of the invasion angle. And I'm going to set the stage for you to where Booker T was when he came into the company just around this time. And he was really positioned as the main WCW wrestler to come over after Vince McMahon bought the company. Because as we know, the NWO didn't come over, Goldberg didn't come over, Ric Flair didn't come over, Sting didn't come over. All the biggest names that had made WCW what it was and were the faces of that company did not come over straight away. Because of some contracts that they were entitled to from Time Warner. Those big mammoth guaranteed contracts. So they just sat home for the better part of the year and got paid to do nothing. And in saying that, the crop of talent that came over from WCW during the invasion angle was incredibly underwhelming. And that's where you had Booker T and, to a fairly lesser extent, Diamond Dallas Page be positioned as the top guys to be leading the alliance. And that was, you know, the faction that was formed between WCW and ECW. And in a lot of ways, I think the the alliance only existed because they were just so, they were, they needed talent so much. And there was so few and far between on the WCW side that WWE had a pre-existing crop of former ECW wrestlers already on its roster. You know, you had Raven, the Dudley Boys, Taz, Rob Van Dam, like Paul Heyman was a commentator, so there was an easy connection there. And that's how the alliance really came to fruition. But in terms of Booker T., and how w, how WWF, sorry, whenever I do these shows on a side note that I'm review, reviewing like ECW, WCW, WWF, I, it's always so easy for me to mix up the names. But how WWF at the time was positioning Booker T was as the top dog from the alliance. And his first appearance on WWF television was extremely indicative of that. Oh, 
Booker T in one of his first ever appearances, fairly certain this was his first ever appearance on WWF television, sends the WWF champion Stone Cold Steve Austin through the announce table. And then a couple nights later, he attacks Vince McMahon and hits him with a scissors kick. And as JR said, he was the WCW champion at this point. And as we know, by this point, he was a five-time WCW champion, along with being the United States champion. So it was normal that they were going to try and pit him directly against Stone Cold Steve Austin, who was the WWF champion at the time. So, the Invasion pay-per-view comes and goes, and we get Still and Cold Steve Austin turning heel and defecting to the Alliance. And I think that was in large part because they just truly lack star power. You know, like I said, along with Booker T, they were trying hard to push uh, Diamond Dallas Page in that regard. Kind of flopped. Rob Van Dam, they did a very good job, but he only really hit his stride closer towards the end around Survivor Series. They gave Rhino a decent push, but look at the names I'm saying, and then look on the side of WWF. You know, Kane, Undertaker, Jericho, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Kurt Angle. It was just such an unbalanced rivalry between the two sides which I believe ultimately led to them switching Stone Cold Steve Austin over to the Alliance and doubling down on his heel turn in 2001. And just as this was happening, a week after is when we got The Rock returning after a four-month hiatus following WrestleMania 21, where Vince McMahon had suspended him. That was on screen. In real life, he had to walk away to go film uh, The Scorpion King. But on screen, Vince McMahon had suspended The Rock following um, him turning heel on The Rock and aligning himself with the two-man power trip at WrestleMania 21, or WrestleMania 17, rather, and the Raw that directly followed it. So what we get is Stone Co- is The Rock coming back and being lobbied by both sides, Vince on WWF and Shane and Stephanie for the alliance to try and get The Rock to choose which side he will ultimately side with. And it really caught everyone by surprise when The Rock made a decision, or so we thought it was his decision. What they want?
The Rock ultimately chooses coming back to the WWF, which really kind of made him the face of the company for the succeeding year. Because when this happened, it kind of pushed Stone Cold Steve Austin into the secondary status just because he was the heel leading the alliance. But right under Stone Cold Steve Austin, you had Booker T, who was still the WCW champion at this time. And before they jumped right back into a Stone Cold Steve Austin rock rivalry that many thought they would, that they would rekindle given what had gone on at the WrestleMania that had just taken place four months p- prior, they decided to go a different route and a fresh matchup and have The Rock go right up against Booker T for the WCW Championship. And it all started the SmackDown that directly followed The Rock's return when Booker T and The Rock crossed paths for the first time. Who am I? Who am I? I'm the WCW champion, sucker! Just so The Rock understands this, you're the WCW champion sucker. What's more important, The Rock doesn't believe he caught your name. What's my name? Hell, my name is Booker. It doesn't matter what your name is. So, you know, The Rock does his whole shtick on Booker T, which was funny because, again, it was a fresh partner for The Rock because at this time, or by this time, rather, The Rock had worked with Stone Cold Steve Austin, Triple H, who was on the, on the shelf, The Big Show, Kurt Angle, Jericho. He had worked with all of these guys. So you bring in Booker T, and I think it really elevated Booker T because right out of the gate in his WWF career, at this point it was still WWF, he's working directly with one of the biggest stars that the industry has ever seen. And they really brought Shane McMahon into this angle a lot as Shane was the you know on-screen owner of WCW. And he kind of became like the manager to Booker T. Like him and Booker T kind of became like boys, you know. And it led to a street fight between The Rock and Shane McMahon at the Raw that directly followed this. Which Booker T got involved with and following the match helped Shane McMahon put The Rock through a table. So this ultimately leads to SummerSlam 2001 where The Rock would go toe-to-toe with Booker T for the WCW Championship. And this was the same card that had uh, Kurt Angle going one-on-one with Stone Cold Steve Austin for the WWF Championship. So it was the first ever pay-per-view, and this is a fairly big deal, right? It was the first ever pay-per-view in which the two world championships were defended on the same night. And that's a big deal. Because nowadays we see it routinely. Every single pay-per-view, you have the WWE Championship and the Universal Championship being defended on each and every single night. And now, but at this time, it was such a foreign concept. Like, we were like 20 plus years into WWE existing and there had only ever been one world champion. Unless there was a crossover with the NWA in the 80s. Uh, I'm not old enough to remember that, but... In mo- in modern day, it had not been done before. And now you you have them trying to position the WCW Championship as on par, if not more important, than the WWF Championship. And 
The Rock challenging for this belt was a big way in assuring that that would, in fact, be the case. And it led to a very good match between these two. And I thought that The Rock and Booker T had an incredible amount of chemistry in the ring, especially for two guys that had never worked with one another before. You know, The Rock had came back in, I think it was late July, uh, following the Invasion pay-per-view, and less than a month later, they put on a really good match. And very underrated ring chemistry these two had, and Booker T was a great worker, The Rock was a good worker, so you knew it would happen. And Shane McMahon actually accompanied booker t to the ring and what was cool about this right is that it was still when you had differing referees like for this match it was a wcw referee and then for the wwf championship it was a wwf referee and it was actually charles robinson who is now probably the the veteran official for wwe nowadays but it's crazy to think that he initially came over from wcw and on a side note, I think they should bring that back. Like, remember, like, in the Ruthless Aggression Era where they had the SmackDown referees with the blue shirts? I, I just think it was such... It went a long way to truly differ the brands between one another. But that's neither here nor there. So, when the match got underway, it was clear that Shane McMahon was getting involved all too much. But it took a quick visit from the a APA... To fully rectify that. Just turn off the rocks, electricity, the lights are out. A big assist from Shane O'Malley. Shane O'Malley, it's the APA who Shane screwed earlier. Oh my God, how do you do? Close line from hell. And the boy billionaire just got the So Shane McMahon, who was constantly getting getting involved in this match, finally gets his head taken off by JBL, who at this point, the APA was one of the better tag teams in WWE, and they had just lost the WWF Tag Team Championships earlier that night because of Shane McMahon. So with the APA coming out to kind of level the playing field, it was left just to The Rock and Booker T, mano a mano, to decide the outcome of of the first ever WCW Championship defense on WWF pay-per-view. Is setting the rock up. Booker T can smell the victory. Booker T, the WCW champion, he can't put advantage here. From the rock back to the league. Trying to pick his way back up. Booker T. With the scissors kick. Taking down the challenge. And as JR said, it was The Rock's first pay-per-view match since WrestleMania 17 when he had dropped the WWF Championship to Stone Cold Steve Austin. So a very um, fulfilling return for The Rock to pay-per-view, specifically SummerSlam, which you could argue is the second biggest pay-per-view of the entire WWE calendar year. And this kind of leaves uh, the WWF with the WCW Championship and the alliance with the WWF Championship in Stone Cold Steve Austin. 
And it was a pretty cool sight, right? That walking out of SummerSlam, you have Stone Cold Steve Austin with one world championship and The Rock holding another world championship, which I think in a lot of ways was kind of like a shot across the bow of Vince McMahon at uh, WCW and Ted Turner and Eric Bischoff that like, look, my two biggest stars are holding my world championship and your world championship. The two biggest stars the industry has ever seen are both from my promotion and now they hold both world titles. So who knows if that's true, but I'm sure in some weird way it was Vince McMahon's. Uh, it was fulfilling for Vince McMahon to see that and close out one of his biggest pay-per-view creations with that site. But this was not the end of the Booker T and Rock rivalry. As following this, they kind of put Booker T on a mean streak, and it really was a much-needed thing for the Booker T character. Not And not because he had been in for a long time and he was incredibly stale, but to go against The Rock, it was as if they needed him to kind of become more of a vicious heel. And there was like a there was a scene where you know, The Rock brought out, you know, a little person dressed as Booker T to mock Booker T. Or then the big show came out and was like had the Booker T hair on and a glove and was imitating him. And Booker T just absolutely demolished the big show with a chair. And this ultimately leads to a handicap match at the Unforgiven pay-per-view between Booker T and Shane McMahon versus The Rock for the WCW Championship. So not only are they building Booker T to have way more of a mean streak now, but now you throw in Shane McMahon into the mix and it really stacks the odds against The Rock. And I got to say that Shane McMahon and The Rock had very good chemistry. You know, I've come on here a lot of times and talked about how I really do like Shane McMahon and he's probably in my... I got to say, probably my top five favorite wrestling characters of all time. I just thought he's excellent in almost every way. He knows his character, takes risks in the ring, considering that he's far from a full-time competitor. I think he's fairly damn good in the ring. But this was another wrinkle into this rivalry and the ultimately culmination match between the two of Rock and Booker T. So you get The Rock coming out to make his first ever WCW championship defense and on a pay-per-view that is and it has him going up against a new foe in Booker T and someone in Shane McMahon who for for kind of like two or three years at this point has been on the same side as fighting against tagging again fighting against like Shane McMahon had been a thorn in the rock side for the better part of a year and a half ever since Wrestlemania 2000 And even remember, just a year prior when The Rock defended the championship against Chris Benoit at fully loaded 2000, Shane McMahon was Benoit's manager at this point. So Shane being a thorn in The Rock's side was anything but a foreign concept. And like I previously mentioned, before that, they were tagging together. It were not tagging together, but they were on the same side in um, in the corporation. So we get The Rock defending the championship against Booker T and Shane McMahon. And the whole match, it seems like Booker T and Shane McMahon are going to come out with the victory here. But lo and behold, The Rock does find a way to conquer the odds. Oh, 
So there were a lot of shenanigans in this match. Uh, Tess got involved. Bradshaw got involved. There was Nick Patrick, who was the corrupt WCW referee, who got involved. Then Mike Chioda comes down, you know, pulls Shane off of the rock. And then him and Patrick get into an altercation. Booker T hits Chioda outside the ring, and it ultimately leads to... Earl Hebner running down the ramp and sliding into the ring to count the one, two, three to secure the Rock's titled retention against Booker T and Shaman Man. And another thing that I haven't talked about to this point, which I can't believe completely escaped me, but the Rock and Booker T had the same finishing move, or one of, you know, the bookend and the Rock bottom. So that was another thing about this rivalry. That just was a cool wrinkle, right? Like, it obviously wasn't the main thing by any stretch, but it was a fairly cool wrinkle that had, um, that, that gave us a reason to maybe be intrigued a little bit more than we otherwise would be. But I think more so than anything else, it was a good thing for, a good rivalry rather, for Booker T to start out with. For Booker T, although he lost and he ultimately kind of slid down the card and the ranks in the closing months of the invasion angle, because after this, it kind of became more about The Rock and Chris Jericho over the WCW Championship and Kurt Angle and Austin over the WWF Championship. I think it was a good thing that set the tone for Booker T in his career in WWE because I think him coming out of the gate so hot was very important for him sustaining long-term success in the company because it gave him credibility right out of the gate. And you look at a lot of the other guys who came over from WCW, you know, even Diamond Dallas Page, who after Booker T was arguably the biggest one. And I'm talking about the guys who came over right away because I know the NWO showed up a few months later, Goldberg, Scott Steiner, they all ended up coming. But I'm referring to the guys who initially came over for the invasion angle. So, I mean, Diamond Dallas Page lasted barely a year. You have a guy like Buff Bagwell who completely face-planted, Chris Canyon, Chuck Palumbo, All these guys really didn't even get off the ground. Maybe Billy Kidman had a solid career and a solid run as the Cruiserweight champion over on SmackDown. But, you know, if you really think about it, it was Booker T and a whole lot of nothing else in terms of guys who came came over from WCW during the invasion angle hit the ground running and were able to maintain or he was able to maintain a very very solid ultimately hall of fame worthy career in wwe and i think that you know maybe they could have done a bit more with booker t maybe him and the rock could have had more of a you know balanced rivalry maybe the rock could have not just beaten him in back-to-back pay-per-views to win the championship retain the championship and then good night the lights but in saying that you know it was still important to establish a hierarchy and at this point you know the rock was far and away the bigger competitor the bigger superstar and you know booker t was kind of positioned where he was right out of the gate more out of necessity rather than being deserving of it because you know if the nwo and goldberg were there hard to think that booker t would have been main eventing SummerSlam with the rock over the wcw world heavyweight championship but booker t made the best of it and fast forward 20 years later and he locked down one of the better runs of a wcw wrestler to ever come over to the wwe and all in all really thought this was a good rivalry under the radar rivalry but one that doesn't get talked about that should be a bit more. But anyway, guys, that's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoyed Booker T versus The Rock. Um, as always, you can get me on Twitter at adamarco 25 You can get Matt on Twitter at wrestling underscore audio. You can email him at podcast at gmail.com. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. Until And until next time, I'll talk to you next week.